The equities uh, market does provide the higher risk premium oh, historically. When I was involved with managed futures in the 1980s and you know first part of the 90s, uh, there was more risk premium there because the market was dominated by hedgers who were giving up some risk premium to hedge off you know, their inventories or their purchases. So there was more to go around to the speculators. There were fewer speculators. But mm -hmm. after the heyday of Banish Futures, everybody and their brothers started piling into that market. So there was less premium to go around. And those markets, uh, I don't think, have offered the same type of potential uh, on an ongoing basis. However, there are periods when it when they do, you know, when we get into inflationary environments, let's say. So I think the best way to handle commodities and manage futures is to use something like dual momentum. So you get in when it's actually doing something. Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review, or even buy us a coffee via the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Gary Antonacci, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. G'day, Rich. G'day, Simon. Hi, Gary. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too, Rich. Looking forward to to this chat, Gary. And um, yeah, we're very uh, honoured to have you on the show. Obviously, you're an author of the uh, the infamous Dual Momentum book, and congratulations on developing that innovative approach to the markets. Um, we know that uh, you've got an MBA from Harvard. You've spent a great deal of time as a practitioner actually trading mm. and you've also contributed substantially in the academic uh, side of things to our industry um, and a lot of people are reasonably familiar with your background but perhaps if you could give us just a, a very brief overview of um, how you got into the markets, what brought you to, to this stage, some of your interactions uh, with uh, with other notable traders, let's say, along the way, and uh, and we'll take it from there. All right. <clears throat> um, I entered the, the industry right out of college in um, the mid-70s, uh, working on the brokerage side for a few years. And then I went to Harvard, got my MBA degree, and um, never had to look for a job because I just started managing money while I was there. Uh, my uh, classmates, their families, and even one of my professors um, worked in uh, the options area for a while, uh, had arrangements with market makers on the exchange floors, and then gravitated towards uh, managed futures, where I teamed up with uh, some of the best traders in the world, like Paul Tudor Jones, and Richard Dennis, and Roe Trout, uh, uh, people like that. And... Uh, I would handle the portfolio aspects of uh, construction and l let them do the trading, and that was very successful. We never had a losing year over the next 10 years or so. And um, I sold that business to a brokerage firm and uh, did some other things, some fun things for a while, uh, but always kept an eye out for other opportunities for investing my own capital and uh, stayed really conservative until, because I never found anything that looked that attractive to me. Um, always wanted to find something, some niches where I could feel like I was exploiting opportunities that others were not. Um, and then I stumbled across Momentum about 14, 15 years ago, read all the academic papers on it and could see the value there because I was already familiar with trend following and, uh, and with relative strength. Uh, so I just saw a better way to do it and wrote a couple of research papers myself and my book, which was meant uh, for the public as a way to protect them from horrendous drawdowns in the market 
And uh, at the same time, I was working on developing proprietary models that uh, would actually do things uh, more efficiently and uh, could boost the expected return as well as uh, provide downside protection. So that's basically what I've been doing the last uh, 10 to 12 years is uh, working with those proprietary models. I license them to family offices, other large investors, and a few um, investment advisors. So, Gary, they're effectively taking your signals for their own purposes and managing it from their side? Yes, that's correct. Once the signals leave here, I, I have no control over what people do with them. Hopefully, if uh, you know they're, they're smart enough, they follow the signals just like I do. I basically have 95% of my own capital invested in with my own models. Um, so I eat my own cooking. Not a lot of people can say that. <laughs> That's really important. We like to hear that. And uh, so, Gary, do you want to give us uh, just a brief overview of dual momentum just uh, in case some of the listeners haven't really uh, delved into it before? Well, let's start with momentum itself. Momentum is persistence in performance, similar to Newton's second law of motion, uh, something uh, in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, the same thing applies to the market. Something that's moving in a, one direction tends to keep going in that direction. Uh, if it's done on a systematic basis, uh, there are certain look back periods that are relevant when you uh, ascertain that. So that's basically what relative strength uh, momentum is all about, as well as uh, absolute momentum, which is a uh, trend. Uh, relative momentum is where you compare an asset versus its peers or other assets, and you pick whichever is strongest. Uh, now, you can also use relative momentum by comparing an a asset's performance to the market as a whole, uh, we deal with ETFs, so one of the things we do is we compare an ETF's performance to the performance of all other ETFs. So that's relative strength. Now, absolute momentum is trend following. That's where you're looking at rate of change over certain periods of time. And uh, if you pick those times properly, then uh, there should be persistence in performance. On an, on an absolute basis. So what my contribution was marrying the two together. Uh, we look at absolute momentum or trend to ascertain whether we should be in something like the stock market, you know, if it's been going up or hasn't been going up. And once we decide, say we wanna be in the stock market, then we use relative strength to determine which areas of the market we wanna be in. My research showed and other uh, academics who have done the same kind of study have also shown that uh, momentum performs best when applied to ge geographically diversified uh, stock indices. Mm. So that's the area that we focus on. But momentum works better than buy and hold in pretty much every area. So we also apply momentum to the different parts of the fixed income market. Uh, we'll apply it as an overlay to commodities, managed futures, um, other things like that. Uh, there are a lot of people now who think, well, we'll just diversify with stocks and bonds, or maybe we'll throw in a little bit of managed futures or commodities. Uh, and what happens when you do that is uh, there is some value in diversification, you know, as long as you have some non-correlation there. But those correlations are not always constant. Stocks and bonds can move together, as we saw in 2022. Uh, there's also uh, a problem of uh, creating a drag on performance for assets that are underperforming. So by using dual momentum, we can always be in something that is showing the best potential. And that reduces the, the type of drag on performance that people have who just allocate uh, on a permanent basis to stocks, bonds, and other assets. Mm. Gary, just in relation to the fact that you're marrying both absolute momentum with your relative momentum, your uh, your strategies are long only. 
you're only focused on long only um, momentum? That's correct. We've looked at uh, doing things on the short side, but uh, really haven't found anything that works because the markets, at least stock market, and tends to uh, have an upward bias. So by the time you know you get in and get out of your short positions, you you're better off being in something else because if you have a wide enough range of opportunities, there's usually something that's going up, even if the stock market is going down. And Gary, on your, your relative momentum, you're comparing, say, the, the, the strength of a particular asset class against a, a benchmark, um, which would be like your ETFs or whatever. Have, do you um, sort of offer a lot of different asset classes for comparison where it's selecting the best from a range of asset classes or are you tending to deal with say two or three together that sort of thing well uh stock market is where we want to concentrate on because that has the highest risk premium over long periods of time but there are opportunities in all different areas so we have models uh specifically for the fixed income market we have balance models that incorporate a broad range of markets, and then we have more specialized market models. Uh, we have one for gold, we have one for blockchain, which is a proxy for Bitcoin, actually, but a, one that's uh, gentler on mm -hmm. <laughs> little yes. less volatile and scary. Um, and uh, you know, and then uh, we so we have gold, we have blockchain, we have uh, leveraged. Uh, QQQ, and then we have our broader broader base models, and we have a very stable model for um, fixed income that will go from T-bills or T-bill equivalents to high-yield bonds. It doesn't even have to go into the long end of the fixed income market. And that model, since 1970, has shown comparable returns uh, to the stock market with much lower volatility. Amazing. I saw a blog post of yours on that. Um, so Gary, you mentioned that you started off in futures or you were in futures. Was one of the reasons of moving into stocks then to to harvest that higher risk premium that you just talked about? Were there some other reasons to yes. move into equities? The equities uh, market does provide the higher risk premium oh, historically. When I was involved with managed futures in the 1980s and you know first part of the 90s, uh, there was more risk premium there because the market was dominated by hedgers who were giving up some risk premium to hedge off, you know, their inventories or their purchases. So there was more to go around to the speculators. There were fewer speculators, but mm -hmm. after the heyday of managed futures, everybody and their brothers started piling into that market. So there was less premium to go around. And those markets, uh, I don't think, have offered the same type of potential uh, on an ongoing basis. However, there are periods when it when they do, you know, when we get into inflationary environments, let's say. So mm -hmm. I think the best way to handle commodities and managed futures is to use something like dual momentum. So you get in when it's actually doing something and you don't have a drag on your performance when it tends to not be doing anything except uh, chopping, going around in, in a choppy patterns or uh, erratic trends that don't persist. So if, if, if I'm to understand this, so effectively the model works on the principle of firstly, um, assessing whether there's absolute momentum in whatever you're assessing and you're comparing that to say the, the risk-free rate and if, if it is above the risk-free rate, you're, you're saying, yes, that's a viable candidate. Then it goes into the second phase, which is the cross-sectional, uh, sorry, relative strength phase where you're comparing which is the best momentum signal amongst the candidates that have passed the absolute momentum test effectively. Is that, is that the way to view it? Yes, that, that's correct for our broad-based models. Um, for our more specialized models, they focus more on trend. Uh, so, for instance, our, our uh, 
our uh, leverage Q model, uh, QBAT, that will go into QLD, which is a, a 2X uh, version of QQQ. And that that's based on a, a trend type model, a very efficient one that reduces noise considerably. And then we have some filters in, in addition to that because we want the odds to be totally in our favor. So there, there isn't any relative strength there. It's, it's all trend-based. Now, when the trend is not there in a positive way, then we gravitate to one of our other models, which uses dual momentum. So we could be ah. in... Uh, we could be in le unleveraged stocks on a more diversified basis, or we could be in fixed income, managed futures, commodities, et cetera. Uh, and, and when the trend of the NASDAQ is not especially strong. So your we primary go-to measure is, is your market structure. You're, you're treating that as a priority over the relative yeah. strength effectively. Market structure is important. Um, but it all it all comes down to trend. Everything yeah. is basically trend. Even relative strength momentum is based on trend. It's a trend of one thing versus another. So it's all autocorrelation and uh, persistence of trend. You know, there are just different ways of categorizing it. Uh, now, a lot of people will think, well, let's just take moving averages or uh, rate of change, you know, and, and use that or maybe combine the two together, but the two are very closely related. So you're not getting a lot of diversification in terms of your methodology when you combine moving averages and a rate of change. So what I've spent a lot of time over the past 10 years looking at are more efficient ways of identifying and exploiting trend. And uh, the model that we're using now for three of our specialized models it's all it's all the same trend approach it works so well that i use it in all three models the filters might vary a little bit from model to model I but see. the trend approach is is a very efficient one and 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 it's important to to um keep in mind you know that uh discipline is very important you once you develop these kind of models you have to stick with it uh, the biggest problem investors have is they don't understand fully and appreciate, you know, the worthiness of something like this. Um, and so uh, every model will have periods of underperformance and they, t they tend to move on to something else to their own detriment during those times. Yeah, to their, to very, their mistake, unfortunately. <laughs> Discipline is so very important. Common mistake. Um, Obviously, Gary, these uh, more efficient ways of exploiting trend, uh, you know, the, your own IP that you've been developing over time. But can you tell us much or anything about that in terms of, um, say, what you mean by efficient? And uh, is there anything that's sort of public knowledge that you can uh, uh, help us out with in understanding how one could go about finding more efficient ways to measure trend? Well, by efficient, I mean, you know, less whipsaws, basically. Uh, they get rid of the noise and they allow the trend to come through. And they're sensitive enough to uh, really adapt to the markets well. And when I do an uh, online presentation to people uh, who are interested, I show them the trade setups on charts. And most of them are surprised just to see how few trades there are compared to what they might expect. And uh, these trend following models, you know, can have 50, 60 percent type uh, wins, whereas most trend following models only might only have 30 or 40 percent winning trades. Just a quick question, Gary. So now with this this approach of efficiently identifying trends, when it comes to the rebalance of your models, mm -hmm. are you using the um, that information as opposed to say a, a timing to do your rebalance um, I, I was just thinking you know you might um, be on a very profitable trend that still is yeah. exhibiting the same trending properties but suddenly in the rebalance process you find that a new asset class is now outperforming that mm -hmm. are you switching at that point in time or are you letting these trends play out and using some form of other measure of determining when to rebalance? 
Well, we rebalance whenever we have a, a change. You know, whenever we might switch a position, we rebalance everything. So, and then uh, we also do uh, monthly rebalancing uh, when, uh, you know, just if there's a, even though we, the positions might not change, the allocations might change in some of the models. So there's a lot of rebalancing going on. Uh, and that's a good thing because uh, it provides some mean reversion type uh, profits because when something's run up very quickly, you're taking profits out and putting it with something that, that might be consolidating. So you're buying low and selling high uh, to complement momentum, which does the opposite. It buys high and sells higher. Is that the extent to which you would uh, apply any mean reversion strategy, Gary, or are there some other mean reversion strategies that you've played with? There's a couple of other ways we use mean reversion. Mean reversion is is neglected. Is it, people don't pay attention to it as much as they do trend. Mm -hmm. um, one way we use it is we have a way of identifying when the markets become extremely overbought on a short-term basis, and we'll take profits in our position then and just um, move into a more generalized model because the markets mm -hmm. are very vulnerable then. So sometimes they'll continue going up, but you know we'll participate, but just in a in a less leveraged form. Uh, very often, we get out right near uh, a turning point when we do that. So it's very mm -hmm. worthwhile to add that to some of our models. The other way we use mean reversion is uh, let's say we're not in uh, QLD or GLD or BLOK. Uh, we're just in a more generalized model. And then those ETFs uh, are knocked down. They, they drop significantly, you know, very quickly. Well, we have a way where we can enter in on just a very short-term trade, maybe one to three day trade to exploit that. Uh, and that's worked out very well. I've developed a, um, a strategy called Snapback. I've been using over four years now, uh, applying it to over 80, 80 different ETFs and uh, mega cap stocks. And it works very well. Uh, has uh, over 70% winning trades with uh, gains being much larger than losses. Mm. So it's worthwhile to do those trades when they come up. Uh, they mm. don't come up very often. Maybe once a year on average we'll get one of those, but uh, there's no reason to ignore them. Mm. The relative momentum and rotational approach has often been applied to individual equities within, say, an index as well. Um, you're largely focused on, on sectors and ETFs, focusing just on the US market, non-US or <clears throat> rates markets, for example. Um, is there something to be gained by uh, applying this logic to ETFs uh, only? Have you done any research into uh, applying some of these models to individual stocks? There's been a lot of research on applying momentum to individual stocks, but most of the research, in fact, is done that way because uh, academics wanted, they did a lot of research because they wanted to try to disprove that momentum worked you know, to mm. uh, justify the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, but they actually found that momentum, at least on a research basis, uh, held up pretty much everywhere. Now, Gekski and Samanov have an interesting paper where they looked at momentum uh, applied to individual stocks, applied to uh, geographically diversified stock indices, fixed income, currencies, a uh, number of different areas. And they found that... Uh, stock indices gave the best results, they all beat buy and hold. But uh, geographically diversified stock indices were better than, than everything else. Now, unfortunately, uh, those who uh, try to apply momentum to individual stocks, you know, as judged by the uh, funds that are out there, have, have, uh, have disappointed a lot of people. Uh, it's not to say that they might not do well over, you know, longer periods of time, but over the past uh, 10 to 15 years uh, since they've been around, uh, they haven't done, you know, 
that that well. And on the academic side, there have been a number of papers written to show that's because uh, momentum stocks are more volatile. They have wider bid ask spreads, so the cost of trading can be significant. Um, and uh, there there are other reasons why you know they may not have. Uh, do as well in the real world as as they do when you look at them academically. There's a, a dearth of research on cross-sectional momentum in academic yes. literature, but there's very little on absolute momentum apart from, say, Grayson and Kaminsky, et cetera. But um, why is that? Why have the academics focused on cross-sectional and not absolute? Well, because uh, trend is a dirty word among academics, or used to be, anyway. Andrew Lowe kind of changed that some with his research at, you know, at MIT, but it took him years to get his first paper published, even though it was, it was a great paper, because it just goes so much against the prevailing thought patterns of uh, you know, technical markets. and yeah, efficient markets. Relative strength you know, that was easier to work with because you had big databases of stocks and and every, anyone could go and replicate that themselves. And a yeah. lot of people did. So then they started looking at industries and other markets and different time frames. And they found, you know, that it held up pretty much everywhere, but not so much on a real time basis uh, since then. With um, Can we just plough into ETFs a little, Gary, and just understanding that? We, we chatted a little bit about this mm -hmm. in the past. Um, when it comes to building models on ETFs, backtesting with ETFs, um, to what extent do you weigh, say, the expense, ra expense ratio of an ETF, the, the AUM, the, the turnover, the volume, the liquidity of that ETF, what are the factors to look at in deciding whether, say, uh, you know, one should trade one ETF representing the NASDAQ 100 versus another? And, and what's some of the due diligence you do there to work out your ETF universe? Well, I actually spend most of my time now doing due diligence. There's so many ETFs out there. There's thousands of them. And uh, I'm used to doing due diligence. I did that before when I was uh, uh, running hedge funds. So I sort of know what to do. It, uh, the, the first thing I look at is liquidity. Uh, if you can't uh, get in and out you know, without it costing too much, then there's no reason to go any further. So I look at that. Uh, expense ratios to some extent, but because we're not in these, uh, I mean, we have, some of them we're in, you know, a year, a year or two, but a lot of the time, you know, our holding period might just be three or four or five, six months. So we're not as concerned about that. Uh, and then just how, how it's put together, you know, if they, they seem to, uh, if it makes sense, uh, that, that counts for something. And then how is it done relative to its peers over various time periods? Um, you don't want to go in an ETF that's been erratic. And one of the reasons I, I like to deal with ETFs when using momentum is because you're getting rid of some of the volatility that, that comes from idiosyncratic factors. Uh, in mm -hmm. other words, if you're dealing with individual stocks, you might have earning surprises or management changes or uh, news items that create spikes and uh, trend and relative strength. They don't work as well with spikes. So there's two components to volatility. The first is a continuous process, which is e easily handled. And the other is jumpiness, which is not so easily handled. And you get a, much more of that jumpiness when you're dealing with indi individual stocks than if you're dealing with uh, indice uh, focus and especially broad-based uh, ETFs that might look at a whole market like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. You mentioned um, trading a leveraged version of the Qs as well. So what about inverse and leveraged ETFs? Are there some additional costs to be aware of, especially if you're holding for a longer time period? The costs are higher for leveraged ETFs, but 
that's all factored in when we do our testing to see if, uh, if it makes sense. Uh, there's not a lot of, the only leveraged ETF we use is QLD. It has great liquidity and uh, it tracks, you know, very well. There, there is no real volatility drag, which, which you can get with uh, some of the other leveraged ETFs. Inverse ETFs we don't do for the reason we, we don't go short. It just uh, just doesn't make any sense. Mm. Gary, I'm just uh, comparing and contrasting what you do, say, with the, the CGA trend following industry. And I'm, I'm just, just wondering, the first question would be, um, with your research in commodities, obviously commodities has, has been a, an asset class of choice for the CTA industry uh, because they offer these uncorrelated properties. Now, um, what's the success you've had with dual momentum being applied to commodities? Well, we don't apply it directly to commodities. Uh, we apply it to ETFs that hold commodities. So uh, there's there's a bunch of those. So what we're looking for there are, uh, first of all, we don't want it to be uh, dominated too much by energy, which some of them are. Uh, and then there are other things to look at too. Like when you get into futures, you have a problem with uh, uh, rollovers, you know, and so uh, there can be some front running, you know, if you're doing your rollovers at the same time, there can be a uh, term structure you have to deal with. Um, in other words, if you think something is going to be higher priced in the future, the futures market may already anticipate that. So you have you have to deal with that type of uh, factor when you're dealing dealing with futures that you don't have to deal with in the stock market. And tell me, Gary, how correlated are your models to say the, the CTA trend following models? Um, how correlated are they? I, I haven't really looked at uh, comparing it to uh, <laughs> to CTA. I don't know anyone who'd who'd want to hold what we have along with uh, uh, CTA models. I mean, we incorporate. Uh, CTA type managed futures in uh, one of our uh, models, and then we incorporate a diversified basket of commodities in uh, in a couple of the models. So but I think that's the, that's the best way to do it. The profile of your distribution would have positive skew, would it, or do you have positive skew yes. in the distribution? We have positive skew. We we try not. That's one of the things we're looking at when we construct uh, portfolios. We look at skewness. A lot of people will look at just um, uh, return or return and volatility, but skewness is is important factor. So that could be a whole other talk. And how do you evaluate and and put together uh, efficient portfolios that make sense? And uh, not a lot of people do that. Some people will get a uh, a worthwhile model, and then they'll just throw the kitchen sink at it and say, okay, let's put everything in there. And I, I know some ETFs that have gone out of business doing that because performance mm -hmm. just is, is, is mediocre at best. You have to give some thought to how the models integrate with the markets that you're using. Can we get into that a bit, Gary? So constructing a portfolio and... Um, I'm interested in to what extent you might diversify across your models and add multiple models to a single portfolio or uh, how else you think about the portfolio construction process. Well, we have a variety of models, something to suit everyone. Uh, the, uh, the oldest model is a dual momentum fixed income, which uh, is been around since uh, 2013 or so now. And that uh, uses only the fixed income market. And uh, that is a good anchor for some of the other models because we can get uh, what uh, Nasim Taleb calls the barbell effect by having something that's stable or relatively stable compared to something that's more aggressive and where the correlation isn't very high. 
So by doing that, you can take it more advantage of mean reversion and also reduce your overall risk profile so that you can be more aggressive than you might otherwise be. And so, so you're defending, that, you're defending the, your capital base with one side of the barbell and you're swinging for the fences with the other yeah, in the high risk. That, that, that's true. Yeah, you could look at it that way. Although we, we try to be risk averse in all our models. No, we don't want to just put something in there because uh, it's earned high returns. So for for yourself or for a retail investor who just wants to, they're not so institutionally minded that they just need one one of your models per se for a particular to suit a particular purpose, but mm -hmm. they're really just looking at a holistic approach to the markets and absolute returns. Um, yeah, what are some of the portfolio construction? thought processes? Well, we have all different kinds of investors who use our models. We have one model called uh, Enhanced Global Balance Momentum that it tries to be all things to, all, to you know people. It's kind of just an extension of what's in my book, which is a very simple model. So all it does is um, it adds some look back periods and adds additional assets, but it's basically uh, dual momentum as I write about in the book. Our uh, fixed income model is, is similar. It's dual momentum, uh, very simple. Uh, and both those models rebalance on a monthly basis using monthly data. Then the next iteration of what we do is called uh, AGM or Advanced Global Equity Momentum. And uh, it has two modules in it. One that's more aggressive, that's oriented more towards stocks, and another that's less aggressive, oriented more towards fixed income. And in order to determine which of those two mod modules will be in at any one time, it uses market structure and intermarket relationships, similar to Dow theory, to tell us whether the primary trend of the stock market is up or not. And then once we know which of those two modules to be in, then we diversify among three different ETFs. Um, and they can include managed futures, commodities. Um, the, the aggressive one can include long-term bonds. The uh, less aggressive one can include convertible bonds. So there is some overlap between them. And they use dual momentum uh, to determine which of those uh, different ETFs to be in. And then we have our specialized models. We have one for um, leveraged uh, QQQs, which is QLD. That's uh, primarily uh, trend-based with some filters. Then we have one for gold. And uh, it's difficult to trade gold. So when I found this trend method that worked well with gold, I, I always test for robustness by looking at other markets. So I was... Uh, Surpri pleasantly surprised to see that it performed well in pretty much every market I looked at. So we moved that over and started using it with the uh, uh, QLD uh, model as well. And that we're using it now with blockchain as in addition, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a lot of interest and there'll continue to be interest in uh, crypto area now. Um, but I didn't want to go directly into Bitcoin because uh, it's just uh, it. First of all, it's very volatile. You know, not not that we couldn't handle it. I mean, the model did really well applied to Bitcoin, but it's hard to match that up in a portfolio context because Bitcoin's been a twenty four seven market. There isn't enough data to match it up uh, with with other ETFs and other markets. So blockchain is nice because even if something happens with Bitcoin, say uh, it becomes obsolete someday, you know, blockchain is very important. It's always going to be around. Uh, it's it's a building block for the future of finance and for uh, for security. It, it's it's just going to play a very important role in society, and even academics who are down on Bitcoin and call it uh, a bubble type asset, uh, they're all positive about uh, the blockchain. So mm. we're, we're real comfortable being there. It, it moves, if you pick them carefully, they, they move along with Bitcoin 
uh, that it's just a gentler ride. And Gary, you've got all of these models out there. Have you ever constructed the super portfolio of all of those models and seen how it's how it's gone? <laughs> oh yes, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we, I can imagine that it would be a good one. Yeah, yeah I have fact sheets that show uh, different allocations among the models, so that people can pick and choose what best suits their risk tolerances. Yeah. But even if you just went twenty five percent in uh, and say our fixed income model, DMFI, 25% in blockchain and in gold and in uh, uh, leverage queues, you know, you'd have a really well diversified portfolio uh, without uh, the type of risk that you might think uh, based on yeah. based on our simulations. Uh, nobody knows exactly what the future is going to be like, but. Uh, we have fact for, sheets that lay out, lay out different scenarios and different allocations. For, for a beginner entering this world, uh, what sort of minimum capital would they require to at least start on the, the correct training blocks using your models? What, what sort of capital would they need? Well, some of the uh, advisors I license my signals to, they'll, they take uh, $100,000 accounts. You know, uh, for uh, people that I directly license the signals to, they're usually a uh, million dollars or more before it makes sense uh, from an economic point of view. And those who, who just have small amounts of money, they can use dual momentum uh, based on the model that's in my book. It tells them exactly what to do. Uh, okay. Pretty simple to, to follow. If you were in one of those mega diversified portfolios, uh, 25% here, there, 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 um, what kind of exposure to the market would you have, Gary? Is that like uh, on average 100% of your capital is in the market uh, over time or, or 50% or? Well, it depends on what you mean by the mar in the market. Uh, mm. See, the, all, each of these models will default to AGEM when they're not in their underlying uh, positions. Now, the mm. fixed income one, that's always in some aspect of the fixed income market. So you're going to have whatever that is always in uh, short term, intermediate term bonds. The other 75%, it could be in AGM, and AGM can be 100% in fixed income, you know, if. Mm if the stocks are not going up in, a, in the right direction. So it's possible to be totally in T-bill equivalents, you know, if market mm. conditions warrant that. So we can mm. go from that to being 75% in um, the underlying and 25% in high yield bonds, which is what we're in right now. Uh, that's actually kind of rare to have all the models invested in their underlying but uh, it just happens that we're in gold, blockchain, uh, QLD, and, uh, and the fixed income one is in high yield bonds. So um, we're, we're pretty ag aggressively oriented towards stocks at the moment, uh, but we do have participation in blockchain and in gold as well. Now gold acts as a, a balance to uh, some of the more aggressive uh, stock market positions we have too, and bonds do, of course, most of the time, if you pick the right bonds. Tell me, how did you go in 2022 when the, the correlations with bonds and equities became positively correlated? How, how did that affect your models? We were in managed futures and commodities part of the year, and then we were in T-bill equivalents uh, for most of the rest of the year. And then toward the end of the year, uh, the models uh, started participating in the stock market again. So we, we did pretty well. Okay. And, and listen, let, let's get on to the, what are the regimes your models don't work well within versus we, we obviously know that within you know, momentum driven environments are do very well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bad regimes, um, what, what are the characteristics of those regimes where the models find it difficult? Well, the bad regimes are when markets are choppy, as you know, with any type of trend following, 
you tend to get whipsawed. But our models uh, tend to not get knocked around by the markets that much. And I show that to people when, when they look at the charts. You can see we might get into a position and it'll retrace or consolidate, and we'll just stay with that position. We don't get knocked out very easily. Until there's no major negative skew events, like um, no major adverse events, because you're not using stops or any process like that, are you? Well, the stops are built into the models just by the way that moment, dual momentum works. We're automatically moved into something else when, yes. when the trend isn't there. Okay. And because our mm -hmm. models are more sensitive than uh, people who just, you know, use... Uh, a moving average or something like that. Uh, we don't we don't worry about that. Gary, um, you mentioned monthly rebalancing and monthly data, but you presumably do a lot of work with daily data as yes. well. Are there um, are there a, do, do you find it more advantageous for your style of model to work on the longer time frames and the the monthly data? The, the monthly data is fine for uh, fixed income. You know, that doesn't move around as much as equities or uh, commodities. So uh, we, we saw no reason to change that. And our uh, globally balanced model is fine w with uh, monthly because it's so diversified. It might be in eight or nine different things that balance each other out pretty well. But for uh, AGM onwards, uh, all those models use daily data. Now, AGEM will rebalance uh, every three weeks. Uh, I, because I have daily data, I was able to determine an optimal rebalancing frequency. So it's not one month. It's actually uh, every third weekend that we rebalance. Now, uh, if there's a change in the primary trend of the market, it can rebalance any day that that happens. And then our blockchain uh, gold and uh, QLD models will uh, get their signals any day that it could happen any day. We don't know when that'll be. They have no regular rebalancing period whenever it changes positions. What about leverage, uh, Gary? I mean, you do do some work with the leveraged ETFs, mm -hmm. but in, in general, you don't really need to apply any leverage to these models? No, they're 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 pretty. Uh, you can be pretty aggressive without leverage. You know, blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, like I say, it moves with Bitcoin. It's not not as uh, scary a ride, but it, it's pretty aggressive. Um, and uh, QLD, of course, is very aggressive. So you don't need to add any uh, leverage to that. Mm. And Gary, there's there's no macro macro sort of um, predictions involved at all in your models? It's all just price action? That's all we're looking at here? Yes, it's all uh, price action. Uh, Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, price, price reveals, everything is reflected in, in price. Uh, you know, it might take, take a little time uh, but it gets reflected in price. Uh, by the time you read the news, oftentimes the markets have already moved. People yeah. have already known about it. Who And you're attributing this momentum to behavioral factors, biases, yeah. et cetera, um, lagging uh, information. Very much you know. so. Yes, there, yep. there's an inertia that happens. People oftentimes will take a wait and see attitude, you know, to information. They want to see what's going to happen. And so uh, that creates potential for trends because then they all have to jump in when they see it moving. That's the bandwagon effect. And then they tend to keep keep things going because uh, markets tend to overextend once they get going strongly. Gary, what did you think of Andrew Lowe's book, Adaptive Markets Hypothesis? Did, um I, I was I was taken by it. I thought it was yeah. a great book. What did, what did you think? Oh, all his work is very good. Um, he's a he's a rare academic, you know, who actually pays attention to what's going on in the markets, uh, rather than the vi vice versa, where they just pay attention to what goes on in their ivory towers without mm. uh, looking at what 
what the markets are having. There's a feedback mechanism, you know, in the markets. They, uh, they provide information as well as absorb information. Yeah. And tell me, Gary, any more books on, on the agenda in the future? You've, you've done one classic. It's about time for another one, isn't it? Well, my publisher's been after me, uh, in fact, a couple publishers. <laughs> so uh, eventually, uh, yeah, I've been so busy working on these models that I haven't had time to do that. But now, now that everything has reached a, a final state, other than looking at you know all the ETFs that keep coming up, uh, I, I hope to get to uh, working on a new book. Uh, what, I, what I'll focus on, uh, well, I have I'll have some enhancements to what's in my existing book, and I'll go into some areas like uh, we briefly touched on on how to evaluate different models and trading methods um, and put them together. And then I'll go into uh, a trend because I think uh, people are not paying enough attention to it. Uh, everybody's looking at all these factors, you know, like momentum and value and profitability and small cap and things like that size. Um, and they're not giving enough attention to trend, which is actually uh, provides I think better uh, results than any any of those other factors have been providing. Mm. Uh, let me also say that people who are interested in trend, uh, and this is kind of uh, something that'll be in my book, but uh, I'll give it to your listeners as as a freebie. Uh, awesome. There's a trading platform called uh, Trading View, and mm -hmm. they have a community out there where people post. Uh, different indicators and strategies. Uh, there's probably a couple thousand of them out there. So uh, if you want to see what's available in terms of trend, just go there and have a look. Mm. Uh, there's an enormous amount of stuff, some of it very sophisticated. Mm. Yeah, and probably more of the, uh, the, the modern and current uh, versions uh, created by practitioners rather than some of the more stale yeah. <clears throat> academic approaches, perhaps. What we you, always like to cover off. What, yeah, go on. What you have to be careful of is overfitting the data. You know, yeah, so, that was going to be my question. I said we always like yeah. to wanted to say we always like to ask a little bit about overfitting, and uh, so maybe if you could, uh, your models are obviously very logic driven and and yeah. um, and correlation driven, big picture kind of themes and not so much hunting for an alpha in the market, but still one needs to be uh, aware of overfitting. So what's your philosophical approach to that? Well, the first thing, as you, as you pointed out, is it has to make logical sense. So, uh, you know, momentum is rate of change. So whatever I look at has to incorporate rate of change somehow in it because we know that works. Uh, Grazerman and Kaminsky in their book took it all the way back to the beginning of all the markets, 1600s for it's stocks. 800 years, wasn't it, or something? Mm. <laughs> More than that, yeah. It was, it's amazing how, how far back they went. They went back to the beginning of the rice market in Japan, <laughs> the right. 1200s or whatever. And they found that, you know, simple rate of change, like absolute momentum, like what I've been using, uh, beats buy and hold and reduces uh, downside in all all markets. So first of all, that that has to be there, and we know certain other things that you know just because I've been doing this so long, I know certain other things that that have worked really well. You know, from working with uh, trading advisors, you know, back in the eighties and nineties. So uh, that's the main thing is to make sure that. There's some logic behind it, and you're not just hunting for things. Anybody can fit data. That doesn't mean it's going to hold up. And mm. and then what you want to see, you want to do a, a bunch of robustness tests. You want to see that whatever you find is consistent. You know, you just don't have a, a big spike in performance, and then it doesn't do anything uh, the rest of the time. You want to segment your data and make sure that it holds up across uh, different time periods and across different markets. Um, and uh, 
you want to make have a lot of data. You need a lot of data to do that. So, uh, yeah. uh, and regimes change. You know, every ten or fifteen years, you might have a totally different market regime. So you want to go back over time and see that it holds up because uh, a number of people will look at things over a 15 or even 20 year period and uh, think that it works really well, but it, it may not over the next 15 mm. or 20 years. Is, is, is reserving some data out of sample important in part of those robustness tests for your kind of models or not so much? Not so much because uh, what do you do? You know, after that, mm. you know, what if it doesn't work? Then uh, mm. chances are you'll be tweaking their model until you find something that does, or finding go moving on to a different model. So, uh, I mean, true out of sample is good. So, if if you're looking at a totally different market, or suddenly you have access to a lot more data going back in the past, yeah, that that's valuable. But just to hold mm. out some data. Um, okay. May or may not be be worthwhile. Yeah. So what, what we're finding with the data that with the research you've undertaken and the academic research as well is that this momentum phenomenon is univer is a universal phenomenon at least over the last eight hundred years. So <laughs> it's certainly not going to disappear anytime soon. So when people come to you and say, "Is momentum dead?" What do you say to them, Gary? Well, it's important to understand why it works in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. like like we talked about it, it's uh, behaviorally based, and people's behaviors they won't change much over time. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, you, there's a disposition effect that academics identified, where people tend to sell their winners too quickly and hold on to their losers too long. Well, that that's part of what makes momentum work, uh, because uh, you know, when you do that, then you're creating potential for uh, further price movement in the future. Uh, so that's just one example. There, there are other things that, that come to play too, like um, home country bias. You know, we look at the whole world. Uh, we don't have any such bias. So we're able to pick up whatever premium there might be because there's a lot of home country bias everywhere in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And U.S. markets dominate, so the home, home country bias here is pretty strong. Uh, but that so people might be ignoring opportunities that show up elsewhere. When you're looking at um, elsewhere, uh, in your context, it's obviously outside the U.S. Um, for us, it might be outside Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, say we're looking at non-U.S. markets. If we're really looking for those um, outlier trend following events, would, is there an advantage potentially to looking at uh, breaking up the rest of the world into other segments, maybe Asia, <clears throat> maybe Asia Pacific, maybe Europe, or do you find it sufficient to, to look at the entire non-US market in a, in a single ETF, so to speak, or there would also be... Um, yeah. I believe there's there's ETFs for non-US large cap, non-US small cap, yeah. and, and you can continue to break that universe up. Have you looked at that? Much? Yeah, we segment uh, those markets. We I haven't found looking at specific countries makes a lot of sense. I mean, we do a little bit with Japan in one of the models, uh, but emerging markets are an area that uh, mm. uh, we separate out. Uh, we'll look at emerging markets both on the equity side and the fixed income side. Uh, so that that's a good breakup, and then in terms of the U.S. market, there's there's a a, a number of uh, segments that we we can look at there. So we might be looking at growth at uh, mega cap, uh, at technology based. Um, those are the three that we we've, we've been doing well with lately, um, and there are mm. others. So there are opportunities there. Hmm. Understood. Rich, anything uh, anything else on your mind? Uh, all my questions have been <laughs> answered. And uh, thank, thanks very much, Gary. That's great. Oh, it's my pleasure. <clears throat> Gary, is there some something we've missed uh, that you'd like to speak to specifically? 
I'd say people should um, be willing to to put out some time and energy when they make their investing. I'm I'm always amazed how people work so long and so hard to earn money, and then give relatively little thought to what to do with it in terms of investing. Great point. Yeah. So uh, I like in the fact sheets for my models, I I give links and references so people can actually look at the research and uh, you know if they understand. It's not that hard to understand the research papers if you just read the abstract and look at the uh, the tables and the charts. You don't have to read all the all the details of it. But that's something people should do. They should try to ask questions and uh, do their own research so that they're they're confident once they make a move and they don't just bounce around and move from one thing to another. Mm. Gary, I've got to commend you on, on what you've given to the community with your books and all of your, your insights. <clears throat> it's been remarkable and I, I really appreciate what you've done. It's a, it's a great service to the the investing world. So, um, yeah, big kudos there. Thank you, Rich. Yes, thanks, Gary. I appreciate that. I appreciate the questions you've asked. They've, they've been very uh, right, right on in terms of uh, Great. getting at uh, what's going on here. I think this uh, podcast, it'll be good to link to those articles uh, and those research papers. So we should do that. We'll link to the 800-year study. Mm -hmm. There's a good uh, paper too on... 200 years of trend following in stocks. Yes. Um, trend following in stocks paper I'm thinking of. So I think it's a good opportunity to link to some of those in in this show. Um, Gary, so give us then um, how how people can get in contact with you. Let us know your your website, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, or other um, other avenues that you either publish on or um, or that people can 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 read more about you on. Yes, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I, the best way to contact me is through the website. I have a contact page there. And uh, you'll be able to see uh, some information on all the proprietary models. It's on the uh, website as well. Website, of course, is optimalmomentum.com. Correct. Great. All right, Gary. Well, um, that's that's a fantastic show. We really appreciate it, and um, we'll we'll look forward to following up at some point in the future and see how it's all going. But we wish you all the best, and thank you once again for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much, Gary. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives, so nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.